There you go. Hello, Hi. how's it going? How are you doing, my brother? I'm doing fantastic. That's pretty cool to hear, man. I can hear you just fine. You're trying a new setup, right? Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. That sounds pretty good. I can see you very well. How have you been? Please tell me before before we start with the curating subject. How did you how did you do on the on the holidays? Did you eat a lot? Uh yeah, the holidays were awesome. I actually went down to California and spent a week in Palm Springs, which is a, a beautiful place to go and played some golf, went swimming, went hiking, went biking, and uh got to the gym a couple times, which was good. And then actually I went to Edmonton, um, which is in Canada and Al Alberta. And uh, that's where my, my brother and my dad live. So I went out there right. and spent Christmas there. And then actually I went to this uh, city in Manitoba called Winnipeg and my kids had a, a speed skating training camp. So it was about a two and a half week kind of holiday tour, which was, it, it, was, it was awesome. Yeah, it was good to, to go down to California and get some nice weather. Um, but it was also good to uh, kind of see family and and do some sport as well. I'm glad, man. And you you were also recently in Latin America, right? I think, correct me if I'm wrong, it was Chile? Where was it? I'm sorry. Yeah, so I actually spoke at uh, ISSN Colombia. Right, uh, Colombia, right. Yeah, which was a phenomenal conference. And there was uh, some really, really good speakers. Uh, Eric Bastillo, um, there was... Uh, Yeah, just just a whole but whole uh, Doug Kalman, um, yeah, Chad Kirk was down there. Um, so just yeah, really really awesome speakers. And then from there, I actually flew to Chile and uh, was uh, at a conference there as well, and spoke alongside uh, Guillermo Escalante sure. and also uh, Brad, Brad Schoenfeld as well. So he was down in Chile. So that that was that was great. And Chile is a beautiful country. And I was very happy to be there. And uh, yeah, it was just a really cool experience. That's pretty cool to hear. And I, I hope, I really do hope that Mexico is next on your busy schedule. So anytime you want to come, you're more than welcome. Awesome. Yeah, I would love to come down to Mexico. So hopefully soon. Sure, man. We can train together and get those that footage for the Olympia. What is it? 24, 25? 2025, I think it's 2025, right? Well, yeah, I need, I need a couple. You're right days, on schedule. So, yeah, <laughs> that's my big goal for 2023. Is yeah, basically make make my muscles as big and strong as possible, and uh, hopefully by 2025 I'll be uh, Mr. Olympia. Oh, I'm already rooting for you, my man. So, first and foremost, thanks for taking the time. Every time I do a live stream with. But you know, several several uh, personalities in the fitness industry. It's always nice to to see you commenting and and having you again on on this on this live streams. It's really a privilege, and I think it's a it's a topic that we can begin to to dive in. What I'd like to begin, um, I think it's it's safe to say by physiology, understanding that not only skeletal muscle utilizes creatine, but also the brain. And I think we can dive in from there. Can you talk us a little bit about um? creating metabolism directly in the brain, Dr. Scott? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I think we could start even kind of further back than that. Oh, uh, sure, man. So yeah, so creatine was first uh, identified in, in 1832. So we, we've known about creatine for a really long period of time. Um, and the first uh, creatine supplementation study was in 1926. Um, so we've been uh, studying creatine for basically a century. And, but it's only about in the last 20 years or so where we've looked at the impacts of creatine on brain function and brain health. And it started out with a paper in, that was published in 1998 that showed that if you supplement with creatine, um, you can increase the amount of creatine within your brain. And so it, at the muscle level, it, it's, it's fairly well established now that if you supplement with creatine, that you can increase increase the amount of creatine within your within your muscles and it's a little bit uh, dependent on what your diet is but for the most part um, people get about a 20% increase so that's kind of the average at the muscle level whereas at the brain um, it, it's quite a bit different so it's it reacts differently than at the muscle level and there's definitely differences with regards to Um, transporters, creatine transporters. There's differences um, in the ability 
to make creatine and things like that that can really influence uh, kind of at the brain level um, differences in responses to creatine supplementation. Right, and I think with that, that dimension, two, que two questions come to mind. The first one is the dosage. Is it also around five grams to get that increase in, in, in brain creatine levels? And also, which is more of a uh, curiosity for my part, how do you measure that? How do you measure the creatine levels in the brain? Because I, I know that in the muscle, it could be a little easier, right? Like maybe a biopsy. How do you do that with the brain, man? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely more challenging. So we, we know at the muscle level that uh, the muscle has a lot of creatine transporters called SLC6A8. So those are the transporters that bring creatine into the muscle. Whereas at the brain, we have at the blood brain barrier, there are creatine transporters, but they're very limited. And the other difference is that our creatine, uh, we can synthesize creatine within our brain. So we cannot synthesize creatine at the muscle level, but we can in the brain. And, and we know uh, there's lots of evidence to show that if you take 20 grams per day for five to seven days, uh, you can saturate your muscles with creatine, or you can take a lower dose of creatine, um, three grams per day for 28 days, and you can, again, saturate your muscles with creatine. At the brain level, there hasn't been any good dose response studies. So we're, I'm actually working on a paper with uh, Terence Murati. He's from the University of uh, Nor Northern Iowa. And uh, we just finished up a six week dose response study. And he used a, a near infrared uh, spectroscopy to look at uh, prefrontal cortex activation. And we did, we had a placebo condition, uh, tent another condition where they received 10 grams per day of creatine and another condition where they received 20 grams per day of creatine. And we did cognitive testing and we also measured um, oxygenation within, within that prefrontal cortex as well. And the results are not that clear. Um, so it's not a very strong uh, dose response uh, effect. And so we don't really know what, what the best dose is. So we thought that the higher dose would be uh, effective at increasing creatine within the brain, um, but we're really not too sure. And so if we look at the, the studies, um, they've used quite a, a variety of different uh, supplementation protocols. And some studies show an increase within the brain, uh, but the increase is much smaller than what happens at the muscle level. And uh, so that, that becomes a little bit of a problem with variability in the data and showing statistical difference. But on average, you get about a 5 to 10% increase in total creatine in your brain following supplementation. And do you think external factors like, let's say, dietary intake of creatine through red meats, fish, whatever, and also the stressful situations could have an impact on the creatine levels in response to the supplementation? Possibly. Um, so at the muscle level, it's well established that if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you have lower amounts of creatine within your muscle. And you're, you're actually more responsive to creatine supplementation. So if you're a vegan or vegetarian, there's, there's more evidence or, or you sh definitely should be supplementing with creatine. You can get bigger and stronger muscles. Um, and uh, even if you consume uh, foods that contain a high source of creatine, like uh, seafood, salmon, heron, um, or red meats like beef, um, you can still benefit from creatine supplementation. It, it will just benefit you to a lesser effect compared to if you're a vegan or a vegetarian. But at the brain level, there's actually, there's, there's one study where they campaign, uh, compared creatine le levels within the brain between vegetarians and omnivores, and they actually showed no difference. So, um, that basically gives me some information to say that dietary creatine intake doesn't play a major role on brain creatine levels. There's one study that looked at uh, supplementing creatine and they looked at cognitive changes over time between vegetarians and omnivores. And at the end of the study, the vegetarians improved in cognitive function, whereas the omnivores did not. 
And so there's one study to show that maybe dietary intake could influence responsiveness. But to be honest, I'm very skeptical of that uh, based off of having similar creatine levels within the brain between vegetarians and omnivores. So I think we need to do more research in that area. Right, because that's exactly where it gets a little blurry, right? For skeletal muscle increases in creatine levels, it's like you mentioned, well established. But for brain levels, and other factors may may play a part, and there's no, like you said, also no those uh, response relationship, right? So I, I I'd like to 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 piggyback on that, and ask you about in what populations, under what conditions, have we observed a benefit in brain health overall and also con cognitive function? What are the characteristics of this population that maybe can draw a little bit of light on the subject? Yeah, absolutely. So there's definitely some situations where you can stress your brain and brain creatine levels are reduced. And I think in those situations is where you can get some benefits from creatine supplementation. So there's, a, a, there's a, for example, there's a, a rat study that I posted on my Instagram earlier. Yeah, today. yeah sure. And uh, so they injected these rats with a drug that uh, put some stress on the brain and it mimicked mild cognitive impairment. So uh, that's basically between a healthy individual and somebody with uh, dementia. So they're kind of on their way there, and, but it stresses the brain. And what they found was that creatine was a benefit in that situation. But if they didn't provide that, that drug, there was actually no benefit um, for improving cognition in the rats. Um, so that's kind of one situation or one example where if, if you stress your brain, that creatine could be a benefit. Another situation is, is possibly older adults. Um, right. There's a, a, a sleep deprivation is another situation that you can stress your brain and, and creatine has been shown to, to have some benefit. Uh, mental fatigue, hypoxia, concussions. Uh, there's, there's actually a pretty cool study in uh, former NFL players, so like American football, and they actually showed that they actually correlated the, the number of uh, hits to the head they had, so cumulative head impacts with the amount of creatine in the brain. So the more times that they were hit in the head, the lower amount of creatine they had in their brain, even several years after they finished playing football, which is uh, pretty surprising. That's right. And were these people supplementing with creatine, these football players? So... They didn't, they didn't report that in the, right. their study, um, but uh, they just showed the, that, that association between cumulative head impacts and brain creatine levels. But the assumption is uh, if you can supplement with creatine, maybe that can be protective to the brain and, um, or maybe it can help with recovery following like a traumatic brain injury or head impact. Right, and also I wanted to ask you about the, the study I cited today with you, and it's Oliveira, Borges, and et al. I wanted to ask you the characteristics of this population because they were older adults, and you actually found a positive relationship, right, between creatine supplementation and cognitive function. And I would like so like if you can explain a little bit how did you measure that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, that was a study done with uh, some Brazilian colleagues. So okay. the the PI on the project was uh, Marco Machado. So he's, a, he's been publishing uh, creatine research for quite a few years now and uh, has published a lot of work. And I've been very fortunate that he invites me to, uh, to help with some of the research. And so that was one of the studies that we got published. So we, we showed an association between a couple of memory tests and uh, their dietary creatine intake. There's been other work as well that that showed uh, similar um, kind of responses. And again, those were in older adults. So that's important. So over the age of 60. Another study, um, I have it on my computer here, so I'm just gonna pull it up quickly. Let's see it here. Yeah, it uh, was done by Sergey Ostojik. So Another guy that I've been very fortunate to collaborate with as well, and one of the kind of leading creatine uh, researchers, but they looked at 
dietary creatine intake and cognitive function in US adults uh, age 60 years and over. So our study had 42 individuals in, in that study and we showed a correlation. So it's a pretty small study and it shows some promising findings, but his study had over uh, 1300 people in the study and they showed a relationship between um, dietary protein intake and cognitive function. So that, that was a, a huge study as well. But again, those are association studies and they don't show causation. So True. from my knowledge, there's actually two studies that have been published, randomized control trials that are done in older adults that have shown positive effects of creatine on memory. Is it only that it's found in older adults? Because I, I can recall the study, I, I don't have the citation. Maybe you have heard of it. Well, I'm sure you have heard of it. I think it was a vegetarian population. They were college students that they supplemented with creatine for the no creatine condition. And they performed some cognitive tests, if I'm not mistaken. And the people supplementing with creatine, not being older adults, did a little bit better on those tests. Do you recall that study? Because I don't have the citation. I just have it on the top of my mind. But what, what I'm going with it is, do you think it's more in relationship to the brain status in older adults, or is, is there a possibility that maybe younger people can also have this cognitive benefit? Yeah, so it, it's, it's possible that younger people could have the benefit as well, but the effect seems to be stronger in an older population. Yeah. Um, and, and to be honest, we don't know why. Um, we need to do a lot more research in that area. So we've done a recent uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, and we showed the positive effects of, of creatine on memory. But there was only eight randomized control trials that were included in that analysis. Two of those studies were done in older adults, and the remainder were done in younger population. And when we did a sub-analysis to look at younger versus older, it looks like uh, the, the effect is is really because of that older population that's really showing the benefits. Do you think it's because they, they are in an actual or in a current more stressful brain situation than younger people? And maybe that correlates better with the creatine supplementation? Maybe as a, as a hint, probably? Yeah, I, I think you're definitely on the right track. And, uh, but I, I also think that we need more data to, to really show yeah. that that can, that can uh, hold true. But, the reason why I think you're on the right track is because there are studies showing benefits of creatine supplementation in younger populations, particularly when they're stressed. So if they're sleep deprived, if they have mental fatigue or hypoxia, uh, those are three ways to stress the brain. And creatine could be of great benefit in those particular situations, even in younger populations. And what would be the mechanism in regards to particularly sleep deprivation? Because with, ki with caffeine, it's a little easier to understand. But with creatine, okay, it's, it's a substrate. But how does it function in the sleep deprivation condition? Yeah, so we know that uh, cognitive function is reduced when you're sleep deprived. So if you don't sleep for a couple days and then you have to write an exam, you're going to do quite poorly on that exam. Um, so just your brain is, is working overtime, essentially, in those particular situations. And it needs more energy. And, and one way to get energy is through uh, the breakdown of creatine. So that's, uh, that's, that's basically why creatine could be a benefit, in, particularly in a sleep-deprived situation. And then there was, a, there was actually a really cool study in rugby players where they looked at passing accuracy. So um, what they showed was if they were sleep-deprived, their passing accuracy got worse which is not really a, a big surprise. But if they took creatine, it completely, completely negated the, the impact of sleep deprivation. So even if they're sleep deprived, if they took creatine, they could actually uh, pass accurate, accurately still. So that was really, really cool. Um, I don't think that means that you can be sleep deprived every single day and just take creatine and you'll be perfectly fine. There are lots of benefits to sleeping and uh, there's uh, from both a performance and a health standpoint. Um, but if you are in a situation where you are sleep deprived and you need to perform something accurately, 
And I think uh, creatine could be a benefit in that situation. Because that can be a tough one to study, right? You, you literally have to sleep deprived some people. And I don't know if about the ethics committee will, will let that happen maybe to an extreme. So it's a difficult topic on itself. And I wanted to ask you about one that I found particularly interesting, which is mental health and particular depression, because I know there are a couple of studies that linked also a, a, a proper therapy for depression, uh, depression and maybe anxiety, but also they find, if correct me if I'm wrong, please, a little bit of a benefit from creatine supplementation. Can you talk a yeah, little bit so, about that yeah, one? Absolutely. So there are a, a couple of studies. Um, these are, again, association studies. Yes. So they're not uh, randomized control trials looking at cause and effect. So we need to interpret that with caution. Um, sure. But uh, there are a couple of big studies like that included over 20,000 individuals. They looked at their dietary creatine intake and they showed that those that consume more creatine in their diet had a lower risk of depression. So that is, is pretty cool. Um, I, I, again, I think more data needs to be done in that particular area, especially randomized controlled trials. Um, I'm not suggesting somebody take creatine in replacement of, of other <laughs> therapeutics for depression, um, sure. but, uh, but there, that's another positive effect of, of creatine, which is, which is pretty cool. I think, again, it's where it gets a little bit blurry, but nonetheless, really interesting. Also in, in, in some particularly uh, pathological conditions like Alzheimer. But then again comes to mind what we already mentioned, that maybe it's when the brain is already stressed. Maybe like you and me wouldn't get a super duper smart by supplementing creatine, get extra cognitive function if we're not in a stressful situation, right? Am I getting it right? It's, it's, it's something like that maybe? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, I think it could be a greater benefit in kind of those stressed situations. So maybe if, uh, I don't know if you are sleep deprived or if you have an exam coming up, if you're a student, then that might be a situation to, to consider taking creatine. But uh, for young, healthy people, it's, it's, it's not going to make you smarter. Um, it, it might have other impacts. <laughs> yeah, I know. It might have other impacts, like uh, getting you more jacked, stronger, um, faster, more powerful. But uh, yeah, in a younger population, the data to enhance uh, cognition is is uh, relatively limited in a in a healthy, normal situation. It's a tough one, man. Do I want big muscles? Or do I want big brains? Um, I think in the society we currently live in, big muscles would be the one to choose, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But one, one question that came to mind with that that you mentioned is the, the dosage again and how creatine actually works, for instance, in the brain. Let's say we have a, an important exam uh, in the upcoming week. Can we actually get to the point of that exam with sufficient brain creatine levels? Because, you know, it, it takes a while to accumulate. And in particular in the brain, we don't really have a dosage, like take 10 grams and that will do it. How can we... If, if any, have a practical recommendation if that's the situation that someone's trying to consume creatine for? Yeah, so that uh, kind of original study that was published in 1998 was a, a four-week study, and they took 20 grams per day, and they found an increase in brain creatine content. So there's, there's some strategy or, or, uh, that you can try. Um, but, for example, that, that rugby study, they actually showed um, that if you just took creatine for one day, that it was actually a benefit on their passing accuracy. So they never measured how much right. was in the brain, but we don't know. We don't know how quickly creatine can actually get into the brain. Um, and we don't know the, the optimal dose. Uh, we don't know if there's factors such as dietary intake that can influence it or other uh, factors like that might influence uh, responsiveness to creatine supp supplementation at the brain level. Yeah, we, we got to do a lot more research in that particular area. So I can't give you a, a solid answer because we don't know. And we're trying to do dose response studies, but um, even our data is, is definitely not clear. So why did some people get an increase and some people not? Um, we really don't know.
So in that study was just one day of taking creatine, and then they saw benefits in the throwing accuracy. So yeah, the the uh, that was the cool repeating passing the accuracy study. Um, so they just took creatine for one day, and they showed improvements in in passing accuracy, which was pretty cool. Our uh, dose response study that we're just uh, finishing up um, with Terence Marotti, um, we did a, a six week supplementation study. So with either 10 grams or 20 grams. And we didn't find any major differences between those doses, even relative to the placebo condition. So um, yeah, it, it's definitely not clear on what is the optimal dose to enhance cognitive function and to increase creatine within the brain. That sounds pretty, pretty complicated. Uh, to, to, to elaborate a little bit of that, what do you think are the current limitations in in specifically, specifically cognition and brain health when you study creatine supplementation? Because it's a whole different beast than studying skeletal muscle, right? Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned previously of, of how do you actually measure creatine in the brain? Yeah, which I still, I can get over that. Man. I didn't actually Sounds answer, pretty complicated. I didn't act, answer that question, but uh, probably, probably the best way to measure it is uh, with an MRI. Hmm. So. Uh, but that's a, a very expensive tool. And if you have access to that tool, um, usually you're trying to conduct research um, with other people as well. And they might be medical doctors that are trying to use that particular MRI tool. Um, so it becomes a challenge to convince them, you know what, let's look at creatine uh, to see if we can yeah. make people smarter with this uh, supplement to get access to the MRI. So you have to battle people a little bit, um, but that's probably one of the best ways to measure creatine within the brain. But depending on um, where you measure creatine in the brain, that could uh, influence the results. Uh, getting uh, what, whether you measure total creatine or fossil creatine can influence how you interpret the results. Um, so there's, there's lots of kind of challenges with regards to measuring creatine in the brain. And that's just one side of the story to, to, to measure creatine on itself. But then how do you measure, let's say, the smartness? What do you think? What are the, the I don't know, the, the gold standards for that? Because that's really outside of my scope. So that's creatine on the brain. And then how do you measure that it actually could correlate with someone improving their cognitive function? Yeah. So if, if you look at the studies that have been published, um, they use a whole battery of different tests. Yeah. So that yeah, like, like yours. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, it makes it a big challenge um, when you're trying to, and then the tests are different between different studies as well. So I think we need to do a better job of just coming together with good standardized tests, but each cognitive test has slightly different things. Um, so it's, it's very, very challenging. It's not as simple as uh, kind of in the muscle world where typically we do like a, a lower bot, like a squat or a leg press um, if you want to measure lower body strength, if you want to measure upper body strength, you do like a bench press test or grip strength. Um, those are like really common measures, but, and they're, they're easy to understand. Um, they're easy to understand what they're actually doing and, and what's controlling them. But at the brain level, it's actually very complicated. And that's half the, half the battle is just understanding what you're actually measuring. Do you think maybe in the, upcoming years we can get more standardized methods for, for measuring that and also get a little bit of, more of the clinical side of things interested in creatine because that's what I'm getting really that creatine okay it's already proven itself as a sports supplement in regards to recovery to performance and many other interesting interesting things but in regards to the clinical side like let's say some pathological conditions stressful situations do you think there's a little bit of, of um, I don't know sort of backlash from the clinical people that maybe we haven't crossed? Yeah, definitely. Um, there, there's, for whatever reason, there's, there's a bit of a fear with creatine. Yeah. Um, so I, I think with any kind of uh, supplement that's anabolic or that's going to help grow muscles or enhance performance, people are always cautious with those types of supplements. But the, the evidence for creatine is, is very clear that it's an extremely safe supplement. And we also know that it's a very effective supplement to enhance muscle performance. And now with uh, colleagues such as uh, Darren Kandow, 
he's showing that combined training creatine with resistance training, you could actually enhance bone health as well. So you can make your bones stronger, which is pretty cool. So I think with that information, to know that it's safe, it can enhance function and performance. It could be a benefit for younger individuals to gain lean tissue mass, uh, to gain strength. It could be a benefit to older adults, again, to gain muscle mass, gain strength, um, also improve function as well. Then hopefully we can convince clinicians that let's also look at this other side of it, the brain side, where it could also possibly be of, of great benefit. We already know it's safe and it could be good for all these other things. Let's, let's try it out for this as well. So hopefully we can convince them, but there still is a lot of fear with creatine. Sure, Co correct me if I'm wrong. I do recall that study from, uh, by Darren Kando. Was it the one in menopausal women that improved their, their bone health? Yeah, so he's published uh, mm -hmm. three one-year training studies now. Sure. Uh, and uh, so he did one in, in postmenopausal women and that was published in 2015 with uh, Phil Chilibeck. He's from the University of Saskatchewan. He was actually my, my master supervisor and he was Darren mm -hmm. Kando's PhD supervisor. He's a phenomenal researcher. But uh, yeah, they showed benefits of taking creatine combined with resistance training on uh, femoral uh, hip bone strength. So that was uh, some, some really cool data to show that it not only affects your muscles, but it also affects bones as well. And they're actually finishing up a two-year training study in older adults. Interesting. That, uh, again, resistance training for two years. So it's it's a crazy study um, with and without creatine. And they had over 260 participants in the study. And they, I know that they've shown uh, some, some positive effects on markers of bone strength in that study with creatine. So hopefully they publish it soon. And then when they do, I'll, I'll definitely send it out to you because it's, oh, it's a really cool study. I'd be more than happy to check that, check that one out. <laughs> and Maybe it's a little bit outside of the creatine, uh, of the brain health, I'm sorry, and cognitive function. But I'm really curious, how could creatine help with bone, with bone health? Do you think what I, comes to mind, because I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, I don't recall the particular study. Do you think it's because it helps with muscle function that we can induce more, more stress for the tissue, more, more mechanical tension for bones, and that can benefit on itself and not creatine doing a, I don't know how to put it, like a direct influence on bone. Is it something like that or am I getting mixed up? No, uh, you're, you're definitely right. Um, so I, yeah. there's, there's potentially two, ra two ways. One, the indirect way, as you mentioned. So you get uh, stronger and bigger muscles and those muscles pull on bones and that could lead to bone adaptations over time. There's also some uh, cell culture studies where they had osteoblasts. And those are the bone forming cells. And they sprinkle that magical white powder creatine on top of it. And it increased the activity of those osteoblasts. So it could also have a direct impact. But uh, as, as Darren has shown in, in, in multiple studies is you have to combine creatine with resistance training to get the bone adaptations. There's a nice study done by some uh, Brazilian colleagues, Bruno Gulano. He looked at two years of creatine. It was three grams per day for two years, but they did no exercise and they found no, no benefits on, uh, on bone. So it seems like you have to combine creatine with resistance training to get those bone benefits. Yeah, that's very interesting. And the dosage which was it also five grams, something five along the lines, five to 10 grams? Yeah. A little yeah, less so, perhaps. So Darren uses uh, 0 0.1 grams of creatine <laughs> per kilogram of body weight per day. So if you're 80 kilograms, then that would be eight grams of creatine per day. If you're 100 kilograms, it'd be 10 grams per day. Yeah, if you're, sure. I don't know, like me, like 40 kilograms, then... Uh, It'd be four, four grams of creatine per day. So it's, it's dependent on, on your body mass. I'm not actually 40 kilograms, but uh, that was just a joke. <laughs> Man, for, for somebody looking to the Olympia, I'm sure you are like 140 kilograms. Right? You, 
you use big shirts to cover that up, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but uh, he has shown that this relative dosing strategy is really effective. So the average that he gives is kind of in that six to nine gram range. And that actually seems to be more effective than the lower dose strategies. So we wrote a uh, recent uh, review as well, just kind of a commentary looking at the different studies that were out there. And it seems like the relative dosing strategy and the higher dose of creatine is actually required to get those bone benefits. But again, no study has directly compared a lower dose to a higher dose. So we need, we need good dose response studies for the brain. We also need good uh, dose response studies with creatine on bone health as well. That's super interesting. And that, I wanted to ask you something a little bit different from all, all that we already talked about. But I think it's quite interesting on itself about conflicts of interest. Because when you have a supplement that it's so well proven, so interesting, not only in the sports situation, but also in, in clinical conditions, do you think we can... We can be exposed to certain malpractices let's say some people inflate their prices some people um, overstate the the benefits that aren't as clear as some others like the connective function function on itself and how can we as consumers be weary of all that all, all those um, limitations yeah absolutely so uh, i think uh one of the things that particularly particularly with creatine um, there's certain individuals that are afraid of taking creatine because they think their muscles are going to grow super big and they're just going to balloon up. And I have to tell them that uh, the real effect of creatine is very small. So my example that, that I borrowed from Dr. Darren Kandow is if you're trying to build a cake, you need a good foundation. So that good foundation is regular exercise, um, eating good food, real food, um, and getting sufficient protein, maybe sleep as well. So you get those things, you have a good foundation. And then maybe the icing on the cake is like protein timing or nutrient timing. Um, and uh, then the sprinkles on top of the cake is creatine. <laughs> so that's what creatine is doing. It's making the cake better, but it's not, it's not the most important part of the cake. Um, right. You have to do all those other things to really get some of the benefits of, uh, of creatine. So it's only going to have a small impact. So I think that's important for people to understand as well is that what is the actual impact of, of taking creatine? How much more muscle are you actually going to gain? And the answer is not that much. Statistically significant, but it's a relatively small amount. As you can tell. No. Oh, man, be worried of those guns, man. I'm a heavy creature. Don't shoot, don't shoot, don't shoot. Uh, I'm definitely not uh, close to Mr. Olympia yet, so that's why I need at least two years to get there. I'd say one year, man. One year. I'm optimistic about it. I've seen your dedication, man. I've seen your lifts, so we're, we're going all in. <laughs> yeah. I meant so one final question that I wanted to ask for yourself particularly. Where are the, the, the future research directions? What interests you the most about creating? Yeah, so I, I think the impact on brain health is really interesting. Trying to answer that dose response uh, with, with uh, creatine on different tissues is uh, of major interest. And then um, I'm just finishing up a creatine golf study as well. So oh, there's cool. that study to show improvements in passing accuracy in rugby players. Um, we're trying to see if creatine can help you with putting accuracy as well. So I've been trying to improve my golf game, which is really crappy um, for the last couple of years. And I'm hoping that creatine could have some benefit. Man, you're all over the place. You're over golf, over bodybuilding, rugby, any other sports you plan on competing? Yeah, I got uh, in February, I played this obscure sport called canoe polo. So it's a uh, water polo, but played in kayaks. Oh, and, uh, right. that's so, crazy, man. So yeah, I'm going to go to Edmonton and uh, compete um, in a in a canoe polo competition. So I'll, I'll post some pictures on Instagram and I'll, I'll send you a, I'll send you a few videos. Oh, please, man, please do. I, I'd be happy to root for you, my man. 
So anyway, I think that covers pretty much the, the whole the brain health and cognitive function. I really do want to thank you for taking the time, as I mentioned at the beginning of the live stream. It is always a privilege and honor and, and sometimes really funny to see your comments on, on live streams. So having you as a guest is for me an honor, and I, I hope we can have you in Mexico sometime soon, no? Awesome. Happy to be here, and uh, great to see you. Take care, Dr. Scott. Have a great day. You too. Bye. See you soon, man.